particular delight to welcome you here today for a conversation on transatlantic trade and investment partnership, also known as TTIP, and trade unions. And GMF is privileged to host the leaders of two important trade unions from each side of the Atlantic. We have Rainer Hoffmann, who is the president of the German Trade Union Confederation, the DGB, and we have Richard Trumpka, who is the president of the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations, the AFL-CIO. I'm also delighted that we have Sean Donnan here, who's the world trade editor of the Financial Times, who will be moderating the conversation. The event will be on the record and will be live streamed as well. It is an opportune moment to discuss the transatlantic trade agreement as the ninth round of negotiations on TTIP are currently underway in New York. As you know, unions on both sides of the Atlantic are keenly following these negotiations, particularly as they relate to labor issues. GMF has long engaged in transatlantic debate about trade. In fact, before TTIP was even formally announced, we co-sponsored a transatlantic task force on trade that was co-chaired by GMF senior fellow Jim Colby, a former member of the House, that called for a transatlantic trade agreement. Today, GMF provides important analysis and research on TTIP as part of our Europe program, and we continue to bring together policymakers <coughs> and experts from both sides of the Atlantic for discussions on the prospects and implications of a transatlantic trade agreement. For example, just in the past several months, we've hosted the German agricultural minister, Christian Schmidt, We've hosted the chairs of the Congressional TTIP Caucus. And last month, at our annual conference, Brussels Forum, we had the US Trade Representative Mike Froman and European Commissioner for Trade, Cecilia Malmstrom. And these and other ways, GMF provides a platform for discussion and analysis on TTIP and its impact on transatlantic relations. As most of you know, GMF also supports transatlantic leaders of tomorrow through our leadership and networking activities. I am especially pleased to note that Rainer Hoffmann <laughs> was one of our Marshall Memorial Fellows back in 1991. So it is a particular pleasure to host him here today. I look forward to today's conversation between Mr. Hoffmann and Mr. Trumpka. And I know we will all benefit from their important insights on TTIP. I also want to give a very heartfelt thanks to our partners at the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung for their help in organizing this event. And therefore, I'd like to pass the mic and the floor over to Michael Maya with the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung's DC office. Thank you, Karen. My name is Michael Maya. I'm the country director of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation the largest think and do tank in the world left from the center. Um, labor union, labor issues, trade unions are core elements of our work throughout the world. We have more than 100 offices around the world and this is just one here in Washington. We are very proud that we could organize this first meeting, this first visit of Rainer after he has been elected as the new DGB president to Washington. And I just wanted to give you an idea of what we have been done uh, during the last days and are going to do today and even um, throughout the week. Um, we have met, of course, the counterparts from AFL and CIO, but also from other trade unions. We um, have met the Secretary of Trade we are going to meet the White, White House representatives, journalists, think tanks, and research institutions, mainly to discuss three main topics, which concern trade unions, but all in general, um, trade union movements on both sides of the Atlantic. One is new trends in labor, to remind you, part-time, temporary, or freelance jobs replace traditional jobs, not only in the US, but also in Europe. The second point is the future of work, or the work of the future. There are various factors influencing the future of work, 
on both sides of the Atlantic. This is demographics, information and technology. It's inequality, but also globalization. And we should not allow to influence, we should not allow them to influence us, but we should influence them. We should shape all these factors uh, as much as possible. Um, and last but not least, TTIP, and that's why we are sitting here. TTIP, a trade agreement which is under discussion, is one of the aspects uh, of the whole process of globalization, and it's really, really discussed in Europe, and I know also in the United States. I'm looking forward to our public discussion here, and with these words, I would like to hand over to Sean, who's going to moderate the discussion. Thank you very much. Super. Uh, thank you so much, uh, and thank you both for, for hosting us. Uh, it's always <laughs> wonderful to have a trade discussion take place and to see that there's an overflow room. Uh, this uh, 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 is, uh, uh, makes our egos feel good. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, Sean and I'm the World Trade Editor for the Financial Times. I'm also uh, the resident uh, acronym watcher at the Financial Times, uh, TTIP, TPP, TPA, TISA, for those of you, for the cognoscenti. Uh, the, um, um, uh, uh, there are many others we, we, we can throw in there. ITA, uh, uh, we don't talk so much about the Doha round uh, anymore, but sometimes we do. Uh, and uh, perhaps there will be a new acronym for that at, at, at some point. Uh, I'm also someone who uh, has, has had the privilege over, over, over the last 18 months or so uh, since TTIP's uh, uh, the negotiations were launched uh, uh, to have moderated a number of forums. Uh, and I gotta say, this one's pretty unique, uh, not just uh, in terms of the composition of, 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 of the panel and, and in terms of hearing from, from trade unions. We've certainly heard, uh, uh, I've moderated panels with, with trade union members and representatives beforehand, uh, but I think here we clearly have two incredibly diverging views on this panel uh, of, of, of TTIP. Uh, uh, and if there is controversy about it in Europe, uh, 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 and there were protests at the weekend, uh, I'm sure we can add to that controversy here today with uh, uh, two men will, who will have widely different uh, uh, opinions of, of, of TTIP and where it should go. Uh, that really is the challenge today, isn't it? To, uh, uh, to try and get these guys to disagree at some point. I'm gonna count on your help from the floor uh, <laughs> to, to, to throw some provocative questions uh, our way at, at, at some point. Let me quickly uh, introduce our two speakers here. You have their, uh, their uh, illustrious biographies in, uh, uh, in some of the handouts there before you. Uh, I just wanted to pick on, on, on one point here, and this is perhaps to be provocative and to start uh, the rivalry developing between these two transatlantic powerhouses. Uh, the, um, I noticed in, 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 the, in Reiner Hoffman, who took over, who now serves as president of the German Trade Union Con Confederation, the DGB, since May, uh, took over in May last year. Uh, I noticed in, in here that uh, you represent six million workers there. Well, Richard Trumpker over here at the AFL-CIO represents 12 and a half uh, uh, million workers already. We, should, uh, we have an area to catch up with. The German workers need to catch up with the American workers, perhaps, in terms of uh, unionization. Um, the, um, I'm going to get out of the way uh, after this statement, and really my job here today is, is, is to, it's to stay out of the way uh, uh, and to let these gentlemen uh, offer their views on things. We thought we'd start with five or ten minutes uh, kind of opening statements from both of them on the kind of the view of TTIP uh, uh, from each side of the pond from trade unions. Then we've got a few things that we want to we want to run through. I think uh, we'll then open it up to the floor uh, and get us all the way in, in, in good time around 2.30 I think is, is when we're scheduled to go. Uh, so Reiner, we thought uh, since you're the illustrious visitor uh, we'd, uh, we, we'd start with you and, and really uh, I mean, TTIP, uh, as was intimated in, in, in the introduction, has been a, a, a big topic of debate uh, in Europe. Uh, there's a, a lot of uh, robust political discussion uh, of it now. I wonder, from where you sit, uh, how you view the project and, uh, and, and, and what your latest thinking is on, uh, on what needs to happen for it to be the kind of agreement that you can, uh, you can live with. Yes, uh, first of all, thanks very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to be here, especially um, at the German Marshall Fund, uh, as it has been mentioned. Uh, it's not the first time, but the first time in my new capacity as a DGB president. And uh, as you said, uh, TTIP is um, 
widely debated uh, in Germany uh, as uh, in Europe uh, as a whole, and I think for good reasons. Um, as we are pretty much aware that uh, trade is one of the key drivers of globalization. And uh, our experiences over the last decades has been that uh, globalization has not led to a higher equality, it has increased inequality. So this is a starting point for us to reflect what has to be done to shape the process of globalization for more fairness, for more equality, and what role trade and investment, foreign investment can play in this process. So we are not simply against uh, TTIP because uh, we know trade is a reality. And uh, with a lot of uh, uh, good uh, uh, results, and uh, even if inequality has been increased, uh, we know uh, also the fruits. But um, for us, it's important, and that makes a difference, instead of uh, continuing to organize simply a neoliberal approach of free trade, how we can get out more fair trade, and to which extent TTIP can support this political project for more fair trade. And from a European perspective, um, as we have discussed this also widely under the umbrella of the European Trade Union Confederation, the EGUC, how we can push, especially the new commission with Jean-Claude Juncker and with Céline Malmström, she's uh, from Sweden and responsible for uh, trade, she's a trade commissioner, to take a different approach as the Barroso Commission has done uh, in the last years. Uh, and a different approach means, and uh, the first uh, results are quite uh, positive, that we need a much more transparency. Uh, this was one of the biggest failure of the previous commission to keep everything behind closed doors. That creates suspicion for good reasons. So the first success we have made with the new commission, with Jean-Claude Juncker, with uh, Celine Malmström to open up the doors, to open up the windows and to look more into detail and to have an open, frank, public debate on it. This is the first condition or this is a precondition to make out of the TTIP negotiation a uh, success we have in mind. But the second important element is if we, take, if we talk about trade, we have to talk about labor and what does it mean for workers and what does it mean for working conditions. And here, especially since I have been here in Washington uh, since uh, Sunday, uh, I got even more arguments why we have to put labor into the core of the negotiation. Because it cannot be to talk about a more fair trade approach without any recognition of core labor standards of the International Labor Organization. This is for us a precondition to have an equilibrium between trade and the consequences for labor. At least a recognition would be necessary in if I see how a German company is behaving in the United States, which would be unbelievable and simply not possible in Europe. I think this cannot be accepted. This gives another proof why we have to put uh, the ILO, the ILO uh, core labor standard into the core. That means, for example, recognition of trade unions. That means, secondly, recognition of collective bargaining. Both is not the case in T-Mobile in the United States. They don't recognize the trade unions. Would never be acceptable in Europe would never been acceptable not to recognize collective agreements, to recognize social partners, to take up their responsibility to negotiate on wages, salaries, working condition, working time, so on and so forth. Second key aspect for us, since we have been suffering under this neoliberal approach of privatization, especially if it comes to services of general interest, we know the results and therefore we are pretty clear that TTIP cannot lead to 
more liberalization of public services and services of general interest. Therefore, we have to have clear rules. What will be covered by the agreement and what will be out? And the approach which has been taken now is entirely unclear and not acceptable. So our response is quite easily. Let's talk about services of public uh, and general interest, no doubt. But let's to be clear on which sectors we are talking about and making a clear definition which sectors are covered, which, sec which sectors are excluded. And especially in Europe, where we had a number of privatization over the last decades, that governments, especially also local authorities, should be in the capacity to recommunalize uh, public services if they have been pri privatized before. And a uh, uh, third uh, crucial uh, aspect, and uh, this uh, we have in, in common, we share the view on ISDS. How can it be that between the United States and Europe, we need a specific private provision on ISDS? We have decent legal systems in the United States. We have decent legal systems in Europe. So there is no reason to continue which in, with an approach, and I'm pretty much aware, it was an invention of the Germans. Yeah? Sure. Yeah. For reasons <laughs> from the past, some countries, even a trade unionist, can understand. But between the United States and Europe, I can't understand it at all. Therefore, we have to get rid of it, and this would be the first important step that we could support the negotiation to make them successfully. And we are both ready to support, if you like, to have a decent TTIP agreement which leads to more fair trade, then I think we are on the right path, we are ready to contribute to, and uh, not continuing with this uh, process of globalization without any decent regulation. And let me say a couple of remarks where I see also a number of advantages where we have to look at and to go a little bit more into detail because it's a quite complex issue. But if it comes to harmonization on technical standards, because um, um, this is the core of, of, of the negotiation by the end of the day, and if I compare the situation, I'm not familiar with all the details, but I'm pretty much uh, uh, convinced that uh, Europe is not always uh, uh, the, the champion in, 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 this, uh, in this negotiation. That we have decent standards in the United States, which I can imagine would be also quite helpful, quite useful for Europe, and so vice versa. Yeah. But look, let's look at it. For the pharmaceutical industry, for the chemical industry, for the car industry, many other sectors. If we work closer together, if we agree on the highest standards we have across the Atlantic, I think this could be an advantage also in the objective to have a more fair trade approach, a more fair globalization process, that we are able to set up standards which others, other regions in the world couldn't ignore. This would be something we would work for, we would fight for, and therefore, I think it's extremely important that the Europeans, not only the Germans, I can talk also on behalf of the EGC and the Americans and AFL-CIO, we work hard on it to get a more fair globalization, to get a more fair trade agreement. Um, Richard, I mean, you're engaged right now, and you were up on the Hill this morning, uh, uh, mounting uh, part of that campaign to, to try and uh, uh, stop the Trade Promotion Authority from going through Congress, uh, uh, but also a, a, a fight that will come back to Congress later this year on the on the Trans-Pacific Partnership and, and uh, dealing with that. That's kind of on your immediate agenda. I wonder how you view TTIP uh, fitting in with that agenda. And uh, as you as you sort of think about uh, the discussion you're having on TPA, you look at the negotiations that are happening on, t on TPP. How do you how do you see TTIP, TTIP and how is it different? Well, uh, first of all, I guess I, I'd start by saying that uh, the view that uh, an American has of whether trade is good or bad is colored by uh, the experience that they've had. Uh, multinational corporations have had an outstanding experience. Profits have soared, so they're all in favor of it. 
Tom Donahue from the Chamber of Commerce uh, testified today and he blessed it and knelt at the altar of uh, uh, free trade. Uh, the American worker doesn't have that view uh, because it's been uh, not as rewarding, not as fair, mm. uh, and not as exciting uh, for the American worker. So there's some skepticism of it. And when you look at uh, Fast Track, we've, we've tried to say no other country in the world has Fast Track except us. And they immediately come back and say, yes, but they have a parliamentary system and as a result of the parliamentary system, they can actually get things done. Well, <laughs> uh, <coughs> we'll see. Uh, uh, you're gonna have uh, 28 countries on TTIP and they all get to vote on things, we'll see. Uh, we'll see how it works. But fast track as it's been constituted in the United States has really been a way to one, keep things secret, keep things non-transparent and not have the debate that my brother Reiner was talking about uh, in, in Europe and have everything exposed. Uh, and so that's sort of the backdrop that we come to, to TTIP on. Now, we actually have more hope and belief that TTIP can be the one place where we can actually get an agreement that works for everybody. Because of uh, our, our cultures are close, our, our standards are, are, are co close in a lot of ways. We think the, that we can get it done and do it right and ha have everybody win in the process. Now, if it's done wrongly, uh, we will probably suck jobs out of Europe like Mexico sucked jobs out of the United States and other places did that. And there are some Americans that would be gleeful about but it quite frankly would be a short term happiness. Because if that were to happen, in the long run, European standards drop, ours would ultimately drop as well, and we would lower both people. And then everybody around the world, because we're talking about 40% of the world's GDP between the, the two of us, uh, I mean 20% of the world's GDP between the two of us and uh, another 40% uh, covered TPP. under TPP. So you're talking about 60% of the world's uh, uh, economy there. So what we're particularly interested in is trying to work with our, our, our counterparts in Europe uh, to make sure that we get an agreement that raises standards, not lower standards. Uh, and there are four or five issues that we're very, very concerned about. Uh, the harmonization of standards is obviously one place that we're very, very interested. Because you could simply harmonize them by saying the lowest standard prevails, uh, which would drive everybody's standard down. Or you could do it the other way by saying the highest standard prevails and then work through which one was right. ultimately the highest standard. And I think both of us uh, agree wholeheartedly that we should be lifting standards up, not driving standards down. Uh, and then uh, Reiner talked about the, the ISDS. Uh, the ISDS has been a, a secret tribunal that has benefited corporations and gives them, foreign investors, special rights that human beings don't have. Uh, no human being can file a case under ISDS. Only a foreign investor can do that. And as a result, uh, it becomes unfair. The, the, and they become runaway panels Regardless of the direction that countries have given the, the panels, right. once they're impaneled, they make a decision. And what, what is a fair and equitable economy to them may not be any, what it means to anybody else. But they have enormous power, the power to overrule regulations, uh, state, federal, uh, and, and county. And last week, uh, there was a case in Canada. Uh, case was... Uh, a stone quarry was coming up to its boundary line. Uh, it needed to expand its territory. It was surrounded by sensitive environmental areas, so it petitioned for an extension of its boundaries, uh, and the agency said, no, you can't have it. It's too sensitive. You'll destroy this area. Well, they went to court. They lost in court, and then they went to the ISDS, and the ISDS said, well, of course, that doesn't mean that's not fair and equitable. You get damages from Canada. And that's just 
That's just one recent example. There are more and more and more cases being uh, filed under ISDS. And uh, let me make one other point. Uh, Reiner's exactly right. I mean, our judicial systems are so well developed, mm -hmm. you, you can't even make the case that somebody needs ISDS because they won't get justice in either one of our courts. But let's assume the thir a third world country's out there. A third world country can put significant pressure on them to reform their system by saying, if you don't reform them, we won't invest there. When you have ISDS, they don't have to worry about the system being reformed. They use ISDS to get whatever they want, and it takes the pressure off of the third world country to actually develop and enhance its judicial system. So it flies directly in the face of what it's purportedly set out to do. So that's, that's the second issue. And uh, Reiner talked very, very clearly about the uh, labor standards, core labor standards, and how those have to be included. Uh, I testified this morning uh, on TPP, and I'll tell you something that I hope shocks you. Because when I first found out, I can tell you, I'm not often left without words. But when the general counsel of the US Trade Representative and then the labor liaison said to us, that murdering a trade unionist or permit committing violence against a trade unionist doesn't violate our trade agreements. I, mean, I was shocked. I mean, how can you have labor standards if you don't have the most basic right, the right to live, uh, let alone do anything else? And that's, that's how far down it can go. And we pledged together uh, the European trade union movement and the American trade union movement, that we would work together to make TTIP something that lifts standards up, not drives standards down. That it helps people, that it doesn't hurt people, that it doesn't just increase the profits of multinational corporations at the expense of society and everybody else. So we're hopeful, uh, but I can say we started five years ago trying to shape TTIP. We've submitted dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of recommendations to the trade representative with specific language about how the agreement could be made better. And I think of the hundreds that we've submitted, maybe four have found their way into the opening proposal that the United States put across the table. I told our uh, trade representative that I don't know about where he negotiated at, but the employers that I negotiated with, if I didn't ask for a wage increase, I surely never got one. Uh, and so he never, they never asked for the improvements that were there. This is a different opportunity. If both of us make up our minds that this will be the standard that the rest of the world has to meet, then we've done something good for everybody, including our workers and our country and everybody else. I just want to uh, sort of test the acronyms a little bit with here with the audience. Uh, it, it's, I'm, I'm conscious that, that I am a, I, I live my life in an acronym soup and therefore I'm more familiar than some with it. But does everyone know what we're talking about when we talk about TPA? I mean, put your hands up if you know what, what trade promotion authority is and how it works. Uh, and so on. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so this, we got about half of the rooms. So let me just very quickly explain that this is uh, what is known as fast track authority. It's it's uh, under the Constitution. Help me out, Richard. If if, if, if I get it wrong. The Constitution says that the Congress, the Senate, uh, and the House are responsible for trade agreements. Right. What this does is say to the president, here's some objectives that we want you to meet. Uh, you come back and we'll give you an up or down vote. Now, first of all, they don't decide who the countries are that will be in the to trade agreement. Second of all, they let the president certify whether the objectives have been met or not. Uh, and, and yes? 
I was just going to say, let, 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 let's just tell them what it is before, uh, tell them the, 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 uh, well, we, uh, the, why you don't it. like it. But yeah. it's a kind of, uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, one of the, uh, sorry, it expired in 2007, was last passed in 2002. Uh, and uh, uh, President Obama, and I think the, the wide consensus, he needs this to complete negotiations on both the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, and on TTIP uh, as well. So it, it's relevant to Richard. What what are the chances of this of this getting through Congress? What do you think the numbers look like uh, right now? There was a bipartisan bill passed uh, introduced last week, uh, and the the Obama administration's hope is that that'll pass through Congress fairly quickly. Well, I, I think on the Senate side, they'll pick up some Democrats uh, in the Ways and Means Committee, which is the Committee of uh, First Jurisdiction. Uh, it'll be passed out of the their... Finance Committee in the Senate, uh, right? Uh, finance yeah, Committee, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, it'll be passed out of there later this week, uh, and uh, or maybe next week. Mm -hmm. They'll probably pass it. I think they'll get fewer votes, uh, Democratic votes, on the Senate uh, floor. So it, while it will pass the Senate floor, uh, they will lose votes uh, on the Democratic side and some Republican vote. On the House side is a much different issue. Uh, they will probably lose uh, 50 to 60 Republican votes, and the Democrats will probably maybe lose 12 to 15 Democrats will vote for it, which means that Fast Track would not pass, uh, and they would have to go back uh, and negotiate it uh, like Bill Clinton did without Fast Track, uh, right. and be more open and more transparent. The um, um, how is that going to affect the, the the TTIP negotiation? I think that's that's that, that's something that we, we can we can come back to uh, uh, perhaps. Uh, Ryan, I'm, I'm I'm intrigued in the politics of of, of trade nowadays in, in, in Europe. Uh, the uh, we saw protests at the weekend. Uh, uh, we uh, against TTIP uh, very specifically, and there's been a very strong uh, social media and civil society campaign. Uh, against TTIP, or, or, or real skepticism there. Just talk a little bit more. You talked about this a little bit in your opening, uh, uh, in your opening remarks about why people are so sensitive to this. I mean, Richard was talking about, uh, you know, Europe and the U.S. have many shared uh, shared values. Uh, this is a, in theory, this is a negotiation among friends. Why the sen why are people in Europe so sensitive about it? No, there are two starting points. Uh, first, uh, as I mentioned earlier there was a huge lack of transparency. So people became really suspicious, suspicious not knowing what's going on there, don't trust uh, to some extent European institutions. There is a, uh, a lack of trust, uh, which has not only to do with uh, TTIP, uh, but if you look to the uh, European crisis, uh, the austerity policies, uh, all those uh, aspects are relevant to understand the protest and uh, secondly, uh, people are concerned uh, what will be uh, the further uh, process of uh, liberalization, uh, of globalization. Uh, will it lead to a further increase of inequality we are suffering from in the United States, we are suffering from in, in, in Europe? And there are specific concerns if it comes to environmental questions, uh, if it comes uh, to questions on food and uh, safety conditions. Uh, there is a, uh, I would argue, uh, there is a, a huge spectrum of, of concerns. There is to some extent, um, others as we are trying to deal with it, uh, not really a vision uh, what we can do with it. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, for example, established by Mr. Gabriel, the uh, Minister of Economic Affairs, um, a so-called uh, advisory board uh, for TTIP, covering all different interest groups, the different stakeholders, uh, where we have a much more uh, constructive uh, debate, but making also crystal clear that between the labor movement in Germany as well as uh, some of the NGOs, we, have, uh, we, we are sharing much of the concerns, uh, even if we um, have taken a different uh, strategy, not simply saying no, because uh, if we say no, we are out of the game. Mm. Uh, but if we too and others say, look, we like to get a positive result out of it, uh, out of it then we have to go in and uh, this is much harder to work with uh, than uh, simply to take uh, a negative standpoint, uh, which, will, uh, which is to some extent understandable, uh, but a different policy approach. And uh, as a trade union organization, we are not focusing on one or two topics. Uh, we have to mm. take into consideration 
the broader uh, uh, approach and broader aspects and consequences uh, on employment, on growth, uh, on the environment, uh, on working and labor conditions, uh, and a lot of other aspects as well. I mean, one of the things you do here, and Cecilia Malmstrom, I think, said this recently in, 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 a, in an interview, is that there's an element of also anti-Americanism in, 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 in some of the uh, 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 in some of the protests. Does is, is that feel like a legitimate? Uh, yeah, th this maybe is is to certain uh, extent is a case uh, which um, is uh, for us uh, surprisingly because uh, this shows also that they obviously have not uh, so close relations as we have in the labor movement uh, to work together and to see um, what we have also in common, uh, even if we are aware what the difficulties we are facing, and which are very similar in the United States uh, as in, uh, in Germany. I just talked with uh, colleagues uh, from the labor movement on the minimum wage uh, campaign uh, you will uh, you have conducted. Uh, we just succeeded uh, ten after a struggle of ten years to get a minimum wage uh, in, in in Germany. So there are a number of issues we are closely cooperating, and that makes it certainly easier uh, than to focus only on one or two particular topics. Yeah. Does this feel, uh, Richard? Like I mean, one of the things uh, people talk about in terms of this being different is a sort of negotiation among equals. I mean, is a, has the U.S. ever really had a, a, a trade negotiation? like this with a sort of equal economic power? Well, uh, not and do, really. And does that no, change? Not, not on the, the yeah. breadth of yeah. this. Now, maybe with some company, you might be able to say, you know, Japan uh, is uh, uh, a developed economy and negotiating with them is something. But the answer is no. I, I think this comes the closest to uh, two equals uh, negotiating. But there's still a danger. Because uh, in many ways, uh, the standards in Europe uh, are much improved over the standards uh, in the United States, uh, particularly when it comes to labor relations and the way labor and management cooperate with one another and work <coughs> back and forth. And there's Sorry. a danger uh, that that gets undermined and you take the American system, uh, which is adversarial uh, from the get-go. I mean, American business doesn't believe that unions have the legitimate right to exist. And so, by and large, they do everything they can to eliminate us. And they find uh, help with politicians in state level, federal level, local level, and there's a continuous fight and attack out there. So this is a more equal sitting down, but it is also fraught with dangers uh, for both sides. Can you imagine there being the political heat in, here in the US, especially as we're gonna have an election year next year, uh, in 26, in a discussion about TTIP compared to TPP? I mean, is it, uh, it does feel coming here as a, as, as a neutral observer. I should state here that I'm an Australian, so I, I am completely neutral uh, in this negotiation. Uh, the, uh, 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 the, uh, but it does feel like there's, there's just inherently a much more controversial discussion to be had on TPP with the involvement of countries like Vietnam and, and, and labor standards there, and, and it seems feels much more like a traditional uh, 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 sort of trade political arena uh, well, on TPP I and TTIP. I mean, it, it's it's hard to imagine the folks on Capitol Hill getting exercised about uh, about the Germans, but perhaps I'm wrong. Oh, well, you know, look, uh, they we we've been trying to get human rights into these agreements, and they finally put a word in, not an enforceable word, but a word that says uh, human rights. And you got four countries that uh, in TTP that have been human rights violators. You got Singapore, you got Malaysia, uh, you got uh, uh, Vietnam, and you got Mexico. Brunei. Uh, yeah, Brunei. Right, yeah. Uh, and, and so they're, those aren't gonna be present in the discussions with, with our, our European counterparts, because you, you don't have human rights abusers there, which is, uh, mm. makes it one less hurdle that you have to go to. You also don't have the level uh, of tariffs between us that you had with regard to other countries. There's a relatively low level of tariffs between the U.S. and, uh, and, and Europe, 2 3%. And, and so the elimination of those isn't going to be a, a game stopper. That's not where the, the major benefit of the agreement is going to flow from. Right. So, but I think that's why we hold out such great hope, Sean, is because there are two equals sitting down. Right. 
Now, the, what, what sort of underlies this whole debate on trade nowadays, and it's, you hear it in the TPP, uh, you hear it at, at, at the Doha round, you certainly hear it with TTIP as well, is the idea of that these are geopolitical endeavors, uh, that they're no longer simply about reducing tariffs and going through line by line through the, uh, through the tariff schedules and, and, and negotiating those, but that these are bigger, uh, these are sort of, it's about holding hands across the Atlantic and, and, and seeing off or uh, uh, getting our interests aligned, or your interests aligned, uh, uh, in, uh, in terms of dealing with China and, and responding to the rise of, of China, in setting the rules uh, for the global economy, uh, in uh, also just strengthening the transatlantic alliance uh, as you prepare for what some people have, have, have called an Asian century. Mm -hmm. How does that, I mean, from, from, from where you said, how does that geopolitical uh, argument plus. Well, certainly, if you, if you are in favor and if you are arguing for a more fair globalization and uh, shaping the process of globalization, I think it would be an important benchmark if on decent levels, as Richard said, uh, the Americans and the Europeans could agree on mm -hmm. that others will not be able to ignore them, especially if it comes to trade. Uh, China and others uh, will certainly uh, have interest to follow, otherwise they would be out to uh, some extent. Mm -hmm. uh, but making really the, the combination uh, to have um, um, to make really progress on labor, social, uh, health and safety standards, not only on technical normalization for trade, that makes really a difference and especially from a European perspective. Over the last decades, we have been proud of what we have been able to develop uh, under the umbrella of the European Union, uh, the process of European integration. Because we as trade unions have been always in favor for the process of European integration because we saw that Europe has the political structures, the political instruments to shape also not only a common market, to be a reference model for other mm. regions in the world. And it has been for a long time a model of reference, especially if it comes to social standards, labor standards. Don't talk about the last two decades. Uh, there have been uh, lost decades, especially, especially under the uh, commission of uh, Barroso. But as a trade unionist, I'm still a believer on a European integration process as uh, setting up standards uh, for shaping the process of globalization. And it makes perfectly sense if we extend this together with our friends in the United States to take responsibility for this shaping of globalization because there is nobody really else than the trade union movement to do this a global, on a global scale and with a clear perspective that we can't continue with this neoliberal approach from the past. Richard, how do you respond to the China argument? Which part of it? Well, the idea that, uh, well, with, with Look, TPP, it, it, it's, it, this is a geopolitical, yeah, yeah, geo-economic yeah, yeah. play, the TTIP is, is, is the same. They, they, they totally undermine uh, the argument when they don't include currency manipulation uh, in the agreement. I mean, China's the chief currency manipulator in chief. Uh, and you're going to have 12 countries over there, many of which have to manipulate their currency because China does. And if you think you're going to wrest control uh, and set the standards for them without arresting and setting the standards for currency manipulation, I, I have oceanfront property in southwestern Pennsylvania <laughs> that I'll sell you cheap. Uh, and so it, it's a failure. I mean, look, if you want to do a geopolitical agreement with China, do it. But don't confuse it with a trade agreement. I mean, we're, we're, we're way past tariffs and quotas. I mean, this is an investment agreement. It does many things. Uh, the question is, who will it work for? And if all it does is attempt to be geopolitical and they forget the rules that affect everyday workers in the United States or with TTIP in Europe or both of us, then it's going to be an unmitigated failure. So uh, the argument is sort of, it's near laughable. Uh, because the biggest thing that China does is manipulate currency and force others to follow suit, and they don't address that. And they allow, because of the 
rules of origin, the lax rules of origin, they give China a total entree into the United States through any one of those countries. So China comes in the back door to, with us. And then let me just throw one last one out at you. We just signed a bilateral uh, environmental agreement with China. Everybody hailed it, right? Okay, so now they move their belchers to Vietnam and send the product from Vietnam in, and they go right around the bilateral that they just signed with them without any pain or the, no gain for the environment. And so it, it's such a weak agreement to, to say that it's geopolitical is like, let me think of an analogy. Uh, to say that uh, an ant is a high jumper. Okay. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm picturing the, the ant as a pole vaulter, perhaps, but it's a, uh, the, uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, the, uh, but in, in Europe, you also you have a different uh, geopolitical landscape lately with, with what's been happening in Ukraine and, and Russia, and you do hear uh, uh, also a question that comes out of, out of European business that, that talks about energy costs. And so one of the big things that the, the industry talks about in Germany, certainly one of the anxieties you hear out of industry in Germany is, my gosh, look at the, the energy costs that our American competitors uh, now have to pay. We need TTIP to help us get hold of some of that cheap gas. We also need it to respond, uh, to build up our energy security in, 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 in response to what's been happening uh, with Vladimir Putin and, 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 and in Ukraine there. Again, that's another side of the geopolitical coin that you hear there in Europe. But yeah, but there, there are many different aspects. So we try to figure it out and not uh, being confusing, mixing everything with everything uh, on energy policy. Uh, you are entirely right. Um, in most of the European uh, countries, uh, f especially for the industry, energy prices are much more relevant than wages to be competitive uh, in a global scale. Uh, so the uh, mistake uh, where we have uh, not uh, been uh, successful is to have really a European energy policy. And what we are calling in Germany the so-called Energiewende was uh, mainly done uh, on uh, the national landscape and ignoring uh, the European dimension. So this would be something entirely different and certainly has a geopolitical perspective if, if it comes to gas uh, from Russia or if it comes uh, uh, to oil from the Arabic world. Uh, if we are successfully in moving towards uh, renewable energies and making us uh, more independent uh, from uh, other resources. Uh, but to mix it up now with TTIP, I think, uh, would be misleading uh, because uh, if I see the debate now also in the United States, oil price is going down, makes uh, it uh, entirely different uh, in Europe, uh, especially in Germany. We have a clear uh, standpoint if it comes to fracking uh, because what, does what works in the United States not necessarily works in in Germany or in, in, in Europe, uh, but there are alternatives if it comes to energy policy and uh, the objective uh, towards uh, renewable energies and a low carbon uh, economy. Um, I'd like to open things up to the floor now. I think uh, there's, we've got a couple of microphones coming around. I can sit up here and ask questions about trade agreements all day, but it, it's, uh, uh, I'm sure there's some provocative questions on the floor, and I'm going to do something provocative and start all the way in the back row, because it's rare that you get a gentleman in the back row raising their hands. Uh, so we should take advantage of it. Given the uh, huge disagreement Sorry, if I can just ask you to identify yourself as well. Mike Snow, journalist. Given the huge disparity in food safety standards between Europe and the United States, and the rejection of genetically modified food in Europe and now also in the United States, is Europe insisting that the Americans come up to its standards, or are the Americans insisting that Europe come down to their standards? And where is this all going to play out? OK, so disparity on food san standards, and, and how is it all going to play out? Uh, should we start, since uh, Europe is, is, is home to much of the debate on this, I mean, do you want to talk about food safety? and? Uh, uh, as a trade unionist, honestly, I'm not really an expert on, on, on food safety. Uh, I see uh, huge reservations on the uh, German and the European side, but uh, I wouldn't go so far to argue that uh, food safety is always better than in, in the United States. 
uh, but let's let's take it seriously if it comes to uh, food and if it comes to agriculture there are a lot of uh, aspects uh, where people are concerned uh, but uh, honestly as a trade unionist I'm, I'm, I'm really, I really wouldn't go into depth because I'm not an expert on that Richard do you want to uh, first of all, I agree with Reiner that our standards are, aren't always higher. Uh, milk, for instance, uh, uh, different standards in the, the U.S. and in Europe. Uh, look, you're not going to get the benefit out of this agreement uh, by eliminating tariffs. You're not, because there's not that much to eliminate. The big, big gains are going to come from this agreement is how we treat the other standards and how you harmonize uh, regulation. And if harmonization is used to drag standards down to the lowest level, you'll find opposition on both sides. If it's used to raise standards up uh, and, and work to, to raise standards up, then I think you'll find support from both sides uh, to do that. Uh, that'll be the <coughs> that'll be the, that'll be where the tussle's yeah. at. Yeah. That and defining uh, uh, which uh, services, if you will. Are, are subject to, to the agreement. Uh, the U.S. approach is to say, these ones are excluded, everything else is in. Uh, and even if they don't exist right now, yeah. uh, you know, 10 years from now, well, they're in because they weren't excluded. Uh, the, the other approach is to say, unless they're named, they're not included. Hmm. And I, that's gonna be an interesting discussion. And on both of those issues, I think we're in the identical place. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say as, as, as the neutral Australian here, they, that one of the striking things is I lived here in the U.S. 17 years ago. I'm coming back to the U.S. after a long time. I just spent the last seven years living in Europe. Uh, it is a completely different food landscape here today from what it was 17 years ago, I, I think. Uh, 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 really struck by by here in Washington. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it's a uh, uh, much higher quality food, just as the UK is a much different place than it was 17 years ago. But uh, yeah, uh, let's go. Is that uh, better or worse, though? I think the food here is better than it than it was. Though I think the you know the, the quality of, of, of the meats are available. I think the UK's it's better than it, than it's been in a long time. Yeah, you, you look suspicious, Richard. I'm just interested in your yeah. opinion. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, we went to the back row. We should come to the front row, but the man in the second row has has had his hand up longer than you guys in the front row. So we'll, we'll come back. And he has a three-piece suit on. And he has a three-piece suit on, which is rare on a hot day in Washington. Well, actually, because it was a cool day when I went out. <laughs> I'm uh, George Dragnich, and I'm a former assistant director general of the ILO in Geneva. So I was delighted to hear both gentlemen refer to the core labor standards. These are the eight conventions that we all subscribe to as what should be the basis for membership in the ILO. The U.S., of course, is a keen member, but has only ratified two of them, forced labor and, and child labor, and isn't about to ratify any more, even the Obama administration, when it controlled both houses of, of Congress, did not attempt to do so. You certainly can't do so now with the current Congress, but even so, there have been ways for the U.S. and the ILO to work together. We've had all sorts of workarounds without having to ratify them. So it can be done. It is done. I'd like to hear, gentlemen, how you might do it within the context of, of, of this, because you'll never get it as a legally binded, binding instrument, which they are. They're treaties. Sure. But, how, but how, do you, how do you practically bring it into the agreement without it being a legally binded uh, Because the the agreement will be legally binding. Good question. I, I think that there, there's two aspects to it. Uh, not only do you have to have the core labor standards recognized uh, and, and have the what they stand for recognized, and I don't care whether you call it the core labor standards, as long as you got freedom of association, freedom to collectively bargain, and those standards as defined are recognized. The second thing you have to have is after you agree to them, they have to be enforceable. And the weakness in the past agreements that we've had is they aren't enforceable. Uh, and so we have core labor standards and, and IKEA comes from uh, Europe over here and they immediately drop to the lowest level of labor relations that's here and their members back home go, I, I don't recognize that company when it came here. 
and before long they want to transplant that back and that's called the spiral to the bottom and that's what we're not going to let happen so I don't care what you call it, you can call it Fred, but those standards have to be in there, the meaning of those standards, core labor standards, core ILO standards, have to be in the essence of the agreement and be enforceable. Now, I think if Mike Froman was here, he would say, well, that's exactly what I'm doing in the TPP. We've got core uh, ILO standards that'll be in the labor yeah, chapter I, there, and they're gonna be enforceable for the first time, and that's why well, you, Richard, should be backing me on this, yeah. Mike. First of all, he doesn't have the core labor standards. He has the declarations, which are not enforceable. Uh, that's the reference that's made. Big, <coughs> big difference. Second of all, even if he did, the, the, there's nothing to, there's no way to enforce it here. You have to depend on a government. And let's see, we have a, gov we have a President Scott Walker, and he's going to enforce labor standards for us? Well, that'll work out real well for us, <laughs> don't you think? <laughs> Uh, so, the, the, Mike's, Mike's agreement, although he's a nice guy, and I like Mike, is just fraught with inaccuracies and holes in it. Because you can't enforce <coughs> what he says is there, even though what he says is there isn't actually what is there. Right. Rainer? No, I agree with uh, Richard said, uh, and uh, once again, uh, I, I was really much surprised to see uh, how uh, European and especially German corporations behaving in the United States without recognizing especially the two conventions uh, Richard has mentioned on the freedom of association and uh, on uh, collective bargaining. I think these are key issues uh, we have to enforce and we have to put on the table and to make a clear link with TTIP. Otherwise, I think uh, we uh, would be really uh, missing an opportunity. Let's go back to the floor. Let's go to the middle of the room. Uh, gentleman there, just keep your hand up. Yep, 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 that's him. Yep, that fellow there. Yep, 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 yep. I'm Basil Scarless. I used to deal with trade policy years ago at the State Department. And I'd like to go back to the first question and have you expand on it a bit, dealing with health and safety standards. They've always been different. It's always been a bone of contention in these types of negotiations. Perhaps one solution would be that we're both civilized, developed countries. Perhaps you can Europe can recognize our standards and we would recognize your standards and that would at least expand trade. Could you both comment on that? So that's the idea of mutual recognition, yeah. which is one of the things we talked about. Reiner. Mutual recognition would be uh, one uh, possibility, but uh, I would be much more in favor if it comes to health and safety standards as it comes to labor standards, that we go really for an harmonization to have decent standards at the highest level. Because uh, this is mutual recognition, you have the risk uh, that you still uh, compete then with different levels. Uh, one are much more elaborated uh, than others, uh, and this would not be uh, what uh, our objective is. Richard. Well, uh, my question would be to you, what's the purpose of the agreement? What do we hope to accomplish by doing a trade agreement? And expand if it's not, trade. if it's not, well, expand trade to what end? So the corporations make a lot of profit? We've succeeded. GDP. We've succeeded. And it, that doesn't matter either. Because as GDP goes up, it doesn't mean that people are living better. Inequality still exists. Inequality grows while GDP raises. If the idea is to negotiate an agreement that benefits the people of both countries, Europe and the United States, then you have to look at bringing things up and not down or simply saying, oh, okay, Europe says okay, we'll recognize your bad trade laws. Hmm. But now he has to compete with those companies that do bad trade laws. And soon his companies will say, I, I like that bad trade law. That's what they do when they come here. They immediately flush themselves of all the ideas that they gained and lived with in Europe. And they go down to the cesspool that we're at. That's what we don't want to happen. We don't want this cesspool on labor relations to get transferred over there to make what is a workable system less workable. Uh, let's come to the front row. I promised you guys earlier. Yeah. Thanks. Again, if you just introduce yourself. I'm Stefan Groby with uh, Euronews European Television. 
Um, I guess I have a practical question. Uh, Mr. Franco, you mentioned at the beginning um, the, the limited input you have when the negotiations start. Uh, I'm wondering. Not input, results. Oh, results, right. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, um, are, you, are you kept in the loop? Um, do they tell you what's going on? Do you know, or Mr. Hoffman as well, do you know where we are in this ninth round With of negotiations? TTIP? Yeah, TTIP. TTIP, they haven't talked nothing about TTIP yet. I mean, it's just in the first stages of trying to harmonize or trying to recognize what the different re regulations are, mm -hmm. so they haven't moved it at all. But, but there's been absolute secrecy with regard to TPP. I mean, even though we're on the Trade Advisory Council, they've classified the documents as top secret. You can't talk to anybody about them. You can't show them to anybody about them. You can't go and ask uh, an academic to do a study on it. Uh, and so they've kept the thing in the dark. And you know, we've had access isn't the problem. Knowing what happens is the problem. And it's been blind. Like I said, we, we submitted 200 plus suggestions. And how they get accepted or rejected, or accepted for uh, minor ones, but how they get rejected and where they go, who knows? How the, how the offer gets formulated, no one has an idea except Mike Froman and a couple of different, uh, a couple of people. Uh, and business has, I would say, more influence. Wall Street has influence uh, on these agreements. You can see the way they come out, uh, how, how much influence they have. Uh, and, you know, we, we're stuck with the, the May 10th agreement that was negotiated by George Bush. Uh, here we have a Democratic president, and we would have liked to have seen those standards increases, but we're going to end up with the May 10th agreement under George Bush, where the government decides whether they'll take something. There were no time limits, so they can go on for years and years. Guatemala, uh, you have uh, six years in running. That dispute's been going on. Uh, Colombia, since the work plan was adopted, 105 trade unionists have been killed, murdered, assassinated uh, in Colombia, and the government does nothing about it. I mean, so it's. It's not just access, actually. It's, it's real input, and we, we have had access. You can say everybody has had access, theoretically. But it's been kept in secret, so the public hasn't debated it. Even the, the fast track, or the TPA, they agreed to the bill. They dropped the bill in on Friday. Notified me late Friday night that they wanted me to testify today. Oh, by the way, they had a, they had a hearing on Friday after the bill was dropped in, 120-page bill. No one except the two authors had read it, so they had a hearing on it that day. Tuesday, I, we only testified today. I'm mark, marking it up tomorrow, and that bill will be done. They fast track and fast track to short circuit the amount of debate that you can have on whether we're going to debate, because that's what fast track is. It's a debate over whether we're going to debate uh, the trade agreement or not. And so they say, no, we don't want to debate whether you can debate it or not. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's a ludicrous um, system uh, that doesn't produce a good product. Let's come back to the room. And, and uh, you gentlemen <laughs> there with your hand up, you had your hand up for a few minutes. Hey, uh, Tim Radon, I'm a fellow at GMF. Um, I guess I should just preface uh, sort of two different statements here. So as an American citizen, I think we do need to have the free and fair trade conversation. And I think that this is really important and I appreciate that you're doing this. Um, because a lot of us have been struggling since the financial crisis and especially my generation, we're still struggling to make ends meet, office workers too. Um, so, but as, as an intellectual, just an academic question, is um, are agricultural subsidies going to be on the agenda between US and Europe? Are we gonna talk about Europe's common agricultural policy? Are we gonna talk about American subsidies, because I think we also need to think about how this plugs into the global trade conversation, because if we don't fix agriculture uh, globally, Doha's not going anywhere. We're not gonna fix trade globally. The World Trade Organization's gonna continue to sputter. Um, and also, I think there should be transparent conversations, too. Thanks. Reiner, do you wanna? Trade is uh, certainly a, a big issue uh, under the umbrella of TTIP. Uh, I can see uh, the interests of the Americans. On the other side, uh, we have uh, quite negative experiences in 
Europe uh, because if you look to our common market on agriculture, it's uh, still a disaster because we are subsidizing it with uh, more or less uh, still a little bit less than two thirds of the EU budget. Uh, there is a, a high need for reform. This will not be resolved. I can't see it uh, in, in the frame of TTIP. You, you, you might not want to stop at agriculture. You might want to talk about state-owned enterprises as well, uh, because they, in fact, uh, get subsidized improperly uh, in a lot of different areas uh, as well. Uh, will they be discussed? Yep. But you'll get to see who has the, the biggest uh, amount of political donations uh, when you see the results. Because the Americans are going to fight tooth and nail to maintain uh, those subsidies because they have a strong lobby. Uh, the ones with the strongest lobbies are the ones that will win. It's not about, they, they want you to say, they want it to be about, this is the best thing for the consumer. But they will advocate multiple things that aren't the best for the consumer because there's a strong lobby. And that's not going to change in this agreement between the two of us. He, he's going to face it on his side. We're going to face it on our side. Uh, the same thing. And it's all the way down the line with agriculture, intellectual property, medicine, uh, state-owned enterprises, procurement, uh, buy American clauses. All of those things uh, are going to be, people are going to be pushing for. The difference is normally with every other piece of legislation that affects your lives, it's out there for people to understand so that you can go to your representative, you can lobby them and say, change this, amend this. But with this agreement with Fast Track, it goes into this black closet and it comes back out and they plunk it down and say, up or down. Now, okay, so you wanted to get rid of a, 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 a milk subsidy. And you say, am I going to vote no, all the other benefits for a milk subsidy? Well, maybe yes, maybe no, depending on how important that milk subsidy is to you. But what it does is it makes it difficult to get a trade agreement that really works for everybody. And one that really lifts everybody's standards up as opposed to driving it down just because of the way the structure is, the system is. Now, every proposal that goes out, they put it out. You can read it on the web after they there. It's there for every citizen to, to look at. You can't get ours. You can't get them. They're classified. This time, more, more than any of the other times before even. So the secrecy in this, in TPP, has been worse than at any other time. And that, that's dangerous to all of us. Because that ought to be out there. And you ought to be able to say, I like it, I don't like it, I support it, I don't support it. But if you don't know, and they come out and they plunk it up or down, vote yes or no. Now, in the name of fairness, I did Mike Froman before. I'm going to do Ron Wyden now, uh, the, uh, the Oregon Democrat. Now, his argument, and, 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 and it was there in the Senate Finance Committee this morning when you were there, uh, is that he's fought to get greater transparency. He's fought for uh, this kind of input period, uh, 60 days, is it, after, after, after a bill is presented for public comment? Uh, after, it's and all after it's done negotiated, you got 60 days to read it. 60 days. And then you go an up or down vote. You still don't get to change it. You don't get to amend it. You can't make it better. You either vote yay or nay. And there's never been uh, agreement, uh, I think, there's been a nay, particularly out of that committee. They've never seen a trade agreement that they didn't love and want. Um, let's go back to the floor. You were, uh, sorry, the third row, just behind you, sir. And then we'll come to you. I am Adam Chekhov. I'm from Congressman Joe Kennedy's office, although I'm here in my own capacity, so I don't speak for the congressman. Uh, it's been said that uh, European companies, whenever they get to the United States, just act completely different from the way they do in Europe. However, when Volkswagen set up a plant in Chattanooga, they ended up, I guess, importing the European model by staying neutral in the union elections and even by proposing to set up German-style work, works councils in the mm -hmm. United States. So. I guess my question is a two-parter. It's uh, one, what was different about this case in Chattanooga, if you two can speak to that, and two, what can be done to replicate that model uh, nationwide, especially when it comes to importing 
works councils into the United States, something that we haven't really seen before. Why don't we group yeah. a couple of questions together here? Sir, you just pass the microphone just ahead. Uh, just. Yeah, I'm Norman Birnbaum from Georgetown University. I'd like to ask uh, each of our uh, speakers uh, about, uh, we've just had a debate in, of, of sorts in this country about how to refer to uh, our fellow citizens. Are they average? Are they ordinary? Are they everyday? Uh, one of the more preposterous aspects of uh, uh, the current political campaign. So I hesitate almost to speak of ordinary members of your <laughs> unions, but I don't know what other word uh, to, 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 uh, to use. Uh, to what degree are these ordinary members interested in, uh, aware of, mobilized, informed uh, about this extremely intricate and yet terribly important debate? Okay, so why don't we start, what's different about Chattanooga and what are your members doing? Reiner, why don't we start with you? So far as uh, Chattanooga is concerned, uh, uh, this is a ridiculous example if it comes to trade union recognition. Because if trade unions are recognized and if they decide at the company level to have a decent uh, system of workers' participation, they should be able to implement this. Um, as it is the case uh, in, in, in uh, T-Mobile, uh, where uh, trade unions are not, uh, simply not recognized. And I think uh, this cannot be uh, in under a framework of a trade uh, agreement between the United States and uh, Europe that we simply ignore such uh, fundamental uh, so provisions. So, so the idea that in Chattanooga, Volkswagen imported German it's, it's labor not It's not the, the, the question, uh, to, to my knowledge, that uh, uh, VW was uh, uh, simply uh, trying to, to export it. It was a debate with the trade unions in Chattanooga and with the colleagues uh, at the uh, plant of uh, UW, and it was a common approach that this should take place in UW right. in Chattanooga as well as it takes place in uh, other plants uh, all over the world uh, if uh, UW is concerned. Great, so great. it's not simply uh, exporting our model, uh, which is, uh, by the way, not possible. Uh, they have to agree upon it, uh, and if there's a common understanding, yeah. and if they like then to introduce it, even in a modified way, however, uh, that uh, should be possible and uh, not simply that we are telling our friends in the United States you have uh, to establish uh, uh, in every plant, in every uh, factory uh, works council, uh, that will not work. Richard? Quite frankly, Reiner, I wish you would export <laughs> it uh, to the United States, because it's a, it's a large step upward. What you had in Chattanooga was an employer, and the employees decided they wanted to work together. And they had to do it a certain way, and they were going to do it. And you had a governor and a, and a sitting senator step in, threaten employees with taking away money and, and their livelihood, and actually lie. You heard me use the L word. They lied uh, to the American public to try to defeat the right of a company and a union for their employees to work together. It was horrible. The difference is that Volkswagen had, had the backbone and the foresight to say, this is what we want. And they actually did bring the values that exist in Europe to the United States, as opposed to saying, like IKEA has done, that says, oh, forget about that stuff we do over there. That's over there. And when you ask them why, they say, because we have to do it over there. We don't have to do it here. Yeah. So this was a company that actually lived by the principles. And quite frankly, I take my hat off to them. And I wish we could get works councils of that nature in more of our plants where employees, workers would have more a say in their future. You know, when, when they design a, an Edsel, guess who pays the price? We do, because we get laid off. We're the ones that lose our job. Now, what was the second part of the Second record? question was, was are our members, are our members aware? Yeah, what, are you, what are you doing to mobilize your members? How are your members mobilizing? How aware are they of the debate? I can promise you that our members are aware. Uh, since 2000, 60,000 factories have closed. Uh, over 8 million people uh, have been certified for TAA benefits, which means they've lost their jobs because of trade. Um, and they understand what's at stake here and how you can have good, fair trade or you can have bad trade and how it affects them. They're mobilized 
In fact, in many instances, they're in front of the leadership. They're pushing this issue more than the leadership is, and some of our leaders are paying catch up with their own members. But in this time around, this is the first time ever that every union in the United States, every single one, whether they're affiliated with me or not, are joined together in opposition <coughs> to Fast Track. We have every environmental group but one that is joining with us uh, in opposing Fast Track. You have civil rights groups. You have religious groups. This is the largest coalition that has ever come together to stop Fast Track because it's bad, undemocratic policy that needs to end. Rainer? Uh, Norman, in Germany, we have a debate uh, at all level of the trade unions in all my eight uh, affiliates. Uh, coming from the plant level, the regional level, uh, up to the uh, confederal level, and we had a crucial debate also at the Congress. And um, I think this is especially in the context that our colleagues are much more concerned not, on the not only on the particular agreement, uh, but on the uh, situation in Europe, uh, the experiences we made with austerity policy, that mm -hmm. neoliberal neoliberalism mm -hmm. hasn't delivered, the opposite is the case, so that we are now looking much more attentive at all levels of our unions, how we can combat this neoliberalism and how can we fight in favor for more fair trade, for more fair globalization. This is a commitment, and TTIP is one of the issues which is addressed and uh, which has uh, a very high attention in, in the, tra uh, in the uh, German trade union movement. Yeah. So we've got 11 minutes left, which means it's time for us to introduce our own fast track legislation here and to fast track some questions. Can we come back to the floor? Yep. Hold, hold your hand up so that they can uh, hand you a microphone right behind you, right over your oh, okay. oh, shoulder. Yeah. Uh, Bill Martin with uh, Atlantic Council. Um, can you explain what is, uh, Atlantic Council. what is different about the situation in Germany and Austria in the labor movement as compared to other parts of Europe as it's reflected in the support or the opposition for TTIP? There are no major differences uh, because this is a common position under the umbrella of the European Trade Union Confederation, uh, which has been approved by all affiliates um, uh, from all member states of the European Union. Uh, and certainly there are some differences, how intensive the debate is, for example, in Poland or in France, that makes a difference. Uh, but uh, the general opinion the general position, uh, all unions uh, under the roof of uh, the European Trade Union Confederation are unified. Uh, this is uh, no big difference at all. Do you have a follow-up there? Or Just wait for the microphone for a second, because we've got... Uh, can, can you also then speak to the well, how that's reflected in, in popular opinion? Because there's obviously a big difference in popular yeah, there's opinion. Yeah, there's certainly there's a difference in, pop, uh, in, in popular opinion. We can see this easily. Um, it has to do with that uh, in some member states it's much more uh, debated, uh, it's much more in the political forefront than in others. But uh, it has also to do with different traditions. I have been, for example, in Sweden, discussed with my colleagues from uh, LO, uh, from the labor organization in Sweden, and the Swedish uh, trade union uh, movement is entirely critical and on the same uh, on the same uh, line as uh, Richard Eim uh, in uh, the Swedish society, uh, the debate is uh, much, uh, much more calm than uh, it is in, in other countries, but this has to do with certain traditions and cultures uh, in the different uh, European member states. Uh, just there, and then we'll come back to the front. Uh, Steve Sylvia, American University. Um, Reiner, I'm curious, on the trade policy, are there differences between the DGB and the SPD as far as how to approach <laughs> TTIP? No, there are no differences, yes. That's some inside, <laughs> that's <some> inside <laughs> baseball here. Yeah. What are they? <laughs> no, we have, uh, it's a good point. Uh, we have started to discuss it uh, spring last year. We established, um, um, as I mentioned earlier, or Sigmar Gabel uh, established uh, some sort of uh, uh, advisory board on TTIP with a number of NGOs, uh, different stakeholders, uh, employers, trade unions. 
Um, since um, SPD and uh, DGB or trade unions have historically a certain, uh, uh, a certain uh, linkage, uh, we have discussed it uh, also between the uh, economic uh, ministry and the DGB and we draw up a common position which is more or less by 90% uh, the resolution we have adopted at the, ET, uh, at the DGB Congress. So uh, Sigmar Gabel as a vice uh, chancellor is very much committed that we don't accept an agreement without any provisions on labor standards, ILO uh, core labor standards. We are entirely critical if it comes to services of general interest. And I just uh, spoke with uh, Rich uh, yesterday uh, that the SPD and especially Sigmar Gabel has understood uh, and he was uh, uh, common behind our uh, negative um, uh, position or that we simply don't accept any kind of private ISDS. Uh, how we could um, have a public uh, settlement or a public uh, mechanism uh, as it has been proposed many years ago under the roof of uh, the WTO by, so by Pascal Lamy. Uh, we are trying to develop this further but our position is that can be a pass through but it has to be linked also with labor standards. Right. Uh, otherwise, uh, it doesn't make really sense. But there are alternatives, uh, and uh, we are not uh, simply uh, uh, ignore uh, any kind of constructive debate how we can get out the best result of this under the so uh, circumstances. And I think at this point, it's probably best if we circle back to where we started. <laughs> Mr. Trumpka, I couldn't help but be struck by your passionate case against Trade Promotion Authority. And I don't know if Mr. Hoffman wants to speak to this, but I'm struck by it because I speak to a lot of Europeans, both here and also in Europe, and I can't think of one that sees a positive perspective on TTIP without Trade Promotion Authority. And the European argument is that you have these negotiations between the US and the EU that necessarily will result in a compromise. So nobody in the US is gonna get everything he or she wants and nobody in Europe will. And so their fear is that without trade promotion authority that you get into a situation where lots of amendments are put on the bill and then it's gone. <laughs> you can't have a transatlantic agreement. So I'm curious, you know, what your response to that would be if, well, it, if it, you're condemning it to failure. And again, I don't know if no, Mr. Hoffman wants to speak to the European perspective. That, that's not true. What we've done is we've offered five or six things that we think could improve uh, TPA and make it workable. The first thing that we say is that Congress has to approve who, th what partner companies you bring in. So you couldn't bring in a Vietnam or a Brunei uh, that are human rights violators until Congress says so. Second of all, we would have uh, the negotiating objectives that are in uh, TPA would be specific to each country because each country is different that you do an agreement with. So you would do those. The third thing is that the Congress would certify when those objectives have been met, not the president or the trade negotiator. Uh, and there was a couple of other things, and if you did that, you could have a TPA that actually worked that we would then support. So it's not like so we're saying you have to have 535 agreements to satisfy the 535 uh, people in Congress, but uh, you have a trade agreement, TPA that actually works and is not a reason to just hide, create secrecy and be undemocratic and abrogate the, the responsibility that Congress has on trade. So an EU-specific TPA is what you'd argue. Mm -hmm. So a TTIP-specific TPA is what you'd argue for. Each one should be specific to the country you're negotiating with, and this would be a European-specific, yeah. So not a 28 different uh, sets of negotiating objectives well, for there the would members be, of the European Union. There, there would be some that would be specific to each country, I'm yeah. sure. I have, uh, uh, I can exercise the moderator's privilege and just ask one last very simple question. Do you think TTIP is going to be concluded in this administration? I'll ask both of you. Concluded? I in this administration, this U.S. administration, by the end of uh, 2016, early 2017. Um, 
Honestly, I don't think so. Um, this will not happen because it's much too complex, especially if we both take our argument seriously, then we have to work hard for it and it will take time and will certainly not going very, very quick. My concern, let me mention this at the end of uh, our debate, uh, is what will happen with uh, CETA. Because if you are very critical on... This is the Canada-EU yeah, This is the Canada-EU uh, uh, agreement, where we, where, we, where we have also specific provisions on ISDS. And the risk is, if this will become ratified, then every American company who has any type of location in Canada can bypass it and uh, taking the CETA ISDS provisions and therefore uh, our first uh, priority is now uh, to see that um, CETA, especially on ISDS, can be reopened. Uh, the Europeans are concerned. Uh, we will have elections in uh, September in Canada. I'm not sure that this will really work, but we will try our very best that the ISDS, as it is in the CETA agreement now, will not be uh, ratified because then we don't have to discuss uh, any longer on ISDS in TTIP. Uh, this is a big risk and this has not been seen in the public in detail, but uh, we will uh, address this uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks uh, quite significantly and we're even uh, in discussion with the Commission uh, uh, to make use of the opportunity. Politically it's possible if there's a political will to reopen it, to look to <coughs> ESDS and to get uh, better um, uh, better ISDS as it, is as it is nowadays. Richard, is, the, uh, is TTIP going to be closed in this administration or is it going to be left up to President Walker? <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there's two chances it'll get done. Slim and none, and Slim's in the Antarctica and won't be back until 2017. <laughs> uh, there's no chance that it'll get completed. I mean, we're in the very, very, very early stages. Nothing will happen next year during an election year. It's not going to be done. Okay. Well, on that happy note, uh, <laughs> the, um, uh, thank you all for, uh, uh, for being such a gracious audience and for helping to provoke uh, uh, what I think has been a great debate uh, here this afternoon. Thank you to our hosts. Uh, thank you, Richard Trumka. And thank you, Reiner, for your time and for visiting Washington.